For this particular SCP tale, I'm going to read the actual SCP first, and then I'll read the SCP's tale or story afterwards. It'll get you a little bit familiar with the SCP that we're talking about in the tale. Item number SCP-1440 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-1440 is currently uncontained and its location is unknown since its last containment breach. Due to the nature of SCP-1440, the Foundation may not have the means to contain it without risking an unacceptable loss of resources and personnel. Until suitable containment procedures can be found, focus should be given to the location and surveillance of SCP-1440, and to minimize civilian exposure to it through the identification of its travel pattern. Description SCP-1440 is a man of unknown ethnicity and age. When questioned about his name, place, or time of birth, SCP-1440 will refuse to answer. Although, it is unclear if this is due to the subject being unwilling to share this information or not possessing it. Though the subject's appearance is that of an octogenarian, it has not shown any signs of aging in the 50 years since its coming to the attention of the Foundation. SCP-1440's anomalous nature becomes apparent once it comes into contact with human population, or man-made objects and remain in contact with them for longer than a few days. SCP-1440 has an acute adverse effect on everything connecting to humanity. Prolonged exposure of any man-made object or person to it will cause increasingly destructive events to occur in SCP-1440's vicinity until the destruction or death of said human element. The only exceptions to this are SCP-1440 itself, and its belongings, its clothes, a sack made of unidentified material, a pack of worn playing cards, and a small glass cup. SCP-1440 appears to be aware of its effect on human populations, and will attempt to avoid coming into contact with them whenever possible. Despite these intentions, SCP-1440 is compelled to travel in what seems to be a highly complex pattern, which invariably leads it into contact with human population. The exact nature of this pattern has not yet been successfully analyzed, and SCP-1440 has not been able to provide any information concerning it. The subject is not actively hostile and will not resist attempts to contain it. Though all such attempts have failed and led to a considerable loss of personnel and resources due to the aforementioned anomalous properties. SCP-1440 was first brought to the Foundation's attention when it approached the doctor, a researcher at site redacted. On her commute to work, SCP-1440 shows unexplained knowledge of the doctor's work for the Foundation and requested her assistance. When the doctor inquired about the nature of the assistance the subject required, it responded that it hoped the Foundation would be able to destroy him. SCP-1440 was brought to the site for questioning, which led to the destruction of the site the deaths of personnel, and the destruction of six safe and Euclid-level SCP objects. All other attempts at containing SCP-1440 have resulted in similar occurrences. Addendum A The following is an interview conducted with SCP-1440 during the fourth attempt to contain it on Area 141. 
The log was being stored on a remote server, hence its survival. Interviewer The Doctor Interviewed SCP-1440 Following the arrival of SCP-1440 to Area 142, personnel began complaining about severe headaches and nausea. In the next two days, three of the four on-site water purification filters broke down. Area 142's hangar collapsed, causing the deaths of multiple airmen, and a doctor, previously in perfect physical condition suffered a complete collapse of both kidneys and both lungs simultaneously. Begin Log Doctor Good afternoon, SCP-1440. And to you, Doctor. Do you know why we brought you here? Of course I do. And applaud you for still attempting to contain me. But since your last three attempts, I came to realize you cannot help me. It would be best if you let me go, for your own good. The first brother is already standing behind you, Doctor. You would best hurry. You mentioned these brothers before. Three, if I recall correctly. Three, yes. Different, but one and the same. All cruel, all vengeful, all capable of holding a grudge for a long time. They are the cause of my misfortune, and therefore, the cause of yours. The subject appears to notice something behind the doctor, though video and audio feed reveal nothing unusual. The second brother joins the first. Time is running short. Release me, or I cannot vouch for your safety. It might already be too late. I'm afraid I can't do that. Besides, you mentioned three brothers. If the third isn't here yet, we must have some time. SCP-1440 shakes its head. The third never appears. In that, he is crueler than both his brothers, for he knows his appearance is the only thing that will set me free. I have spent time, untold, searching for him, trying to return his prize and those I won from his brothers, but to no avail. Subject looks behind the doctor again and sighs. The second has his hands on your shoulders. It is too late now. Doom is never far behind the second. Before you perish, my poor child, allow me to give you a word of advice. Go ahead. Should you choose to challenge death to a game of cards for your life, there is one thing you must never do. And what is that? Win. End log. Closing statement. At that moment, the on-site nuclear device stored in Area 142 detonated despite multiple failsafes. Area 142 was destroyed and all on-site personnel were killed. SCP-1440 was spotted more than 3,000 kilometers away from Area 142's location a week following its destruction, suffering no apparent harm. After three additional containment breaches, attempts to contain SCP-1440 have been suspended indefinitely. Addendum B Due to the growing size of human population and its rapid expansion into previously empty areas, SCP-1440 attested during its fifth containment that it is becoming increasingly difficult for it to avoid contact with humanity while still adhering to its compulsion. Analysis of the subject's travel pattern is continuing as our efforts to find a permanent containment procedure. Thrice the Tale The old man woke, and his failures flooded his mind once more. The destruction of the Foundation base was just another drop in an ocean of guilt. 
Sometimes he didn't know what still kept him afloat. What stopped him from drowning in the depths of despair and madness. From simply ceasing to care about the race he could so easily destroy. Perhaps it was nothing more than simple spite. The dying memory of defiance against his tormentors. It did not matter much. The desert he found himself in was a lonely, empty place, and for that, he was glad. Out here, he could do little harm. He started walking towards a distant chain of mountains, driven by a compulsion he learned long ago he could not resist. Once, he would throw himself into deep gorges, into rivers, into the sea hoping the elements could keep him from causing any more damage. But the brothers were stronger even than them. He would lie in the depths of the earth, thinking he could finally rest in the dark, only to blink and find himself in the world above once more, making his way towards humanity like the bearer of a plague. The brothers were nothing if not persistent. As the soft desert sand crunched beneath his feet, he remembered that thrice a cursed game of cards that led to all of this, to the three follies that sealed his fate. First came the game. He should have never challenged them. He should have known better, but he was young and full of pride and had much to lose. He was a man in his prime when he lost his life in a meaningless war and found himself in the brothers' dark halls. Around him, his fellow soldiers walked silently towards the distant light, not even glancing at the three gaunt figures that showed them the way. But not he. He could not accept his fate. He had a young, pretty wife, a prospering farm. He could not lose it all, and would not. He thought the others were fools, weaklings, to accept their demise. Thus, in his vanity, he challenged his guides and refused to go forward until he was given the chance to fight. He got his chance, and he won. He won too much. Second came his greed. The brothers could not have known how good he was, he took every hand, broke every gambit, stole life from death's grasp with guile and skill. The brothers were displeased, but they accepted their defeat and showed him the door back to the world of living. As he stood at the exit, he suddenly thought, why stop now? He was the best card player to ever live. He could have it all. Why settle for life when he could have glory, power, immortality? He turned and sat back at the table. Double or nothing, he said, and he won again, and again, and again. The brothers were less gracious now, but still, they admitted their defeat. Three prizes he won from them, the cup the cards, and the sack. They were the brother's prized possessions, and they offered him much if he would only return them. Wealth and luck and health and glory. But he wanted to humiliate them, to make death grovel before him. So he took the prizes and left the brothers seething in rage. He would pay dearly. For his vanity. Third came the waste. The prizes were items of immense power, for they could keep the brothers at bay. The first cup held the elixir of life, and a drop of it would banish him, saving even the sickest of men from his grasp. Every time he saw the small death lurking behind the shoulders of a man, he would sprinkle a drop towards him, and the first would flee cursing and spitting. A drop seemed like such a small thing, and the cup held so much water. 
so he used it carelessly. He banished the first from those too old or frail to keep on living, from those the first rightfully owned, and eventually the cup ran dry. When his wife began wasting away from the consuming illness, he had no water left for her. The first sneered as he took her away. The prize of the second was greater, like the second himself. With the cards, he could challenge the second's authority, hold the power of the great death at bay. When war was brewing, when man turned against his brother, he was there to challenge the second, to turn the tides of fire and steel. But like the waters of life, the cards of fate were wasted. He used them for every border skirmish, every civil dispute, every growing revolution, and the cards became more worn with every passing use. Though they lasted for longer than the water, eventually the second refused to heed their call. He watched the world plummet into wars greater than he could ever imagine, watching millions die for nothing in the mud. Watch the innocent suffer and bleed and burn. The second laughed when he took them away. The prize of the third was the greatest. The sack of the all death could hold anything within it, contain even the greatest catastrophes, stop even the most dire forces from ever releasing their fury upon the earth. With the sack, he curbed the fury of storms, drowned fires that threatened to consume entire cities, held creatures most unnatural and fell, whose origin was not of this world. The sack held longest of all the treasures, but it too grew weak. It seems could not hold such mighty powers forever. He used the sack as foolishly as he used the lesser treasures. He stopped storms that would have passed, held fires that could have been contained. His sin was greater than mere wastefulness, though. The sack still held one last use, could hold one last being. In his search for the third, he saw the forces of darkness grow even stronger, saw brave men and women like those of the Foundation risk their lives in order to contain them. Yet, he could not spare the last use of his sack. It was all he had left, his final hope. He knew the only way he could force the third to release him from his endless torment was to capture him in the sack and thus force him and his brothers to let him die. The All-Death never appeared, though, not even to mock him. When the forces of the Unknown claimed the victim, only silence greeted them. Once the prizes ran out, the true horror of his fate became apparent. The brothers feared him no longer and did not forgive his vanity, his wastefulness, his lording over death. They wanted him to suffer, and death was far too good for him. Instead, he brought death upon everyone else, forced to seek the third forever, and to watch humanity crumble in his wake. His curse, like his follies, was triple. Never to die, always to seek, and always to destroy. The mountains grew closer and closer, and the old man allowed himself a moment of rest. His compulsion could be controlled, if but for a short while. He sat down in the sand and turned his gaze upwards towards the stars. In the dark blue early morning sky, only a few remained, but they shine brightly and cleanly. Looking at them, the old man remembered why he kept his head above the water. 
Perhaps this was the greatest of his follies. But it was one he was willing to allow himself. The world was too beautiful for him to allow its destruction without a fight. And humanity deserved better than to perish because of the mistake of a foolish old man. He could not stop himself from hurting them, but he could give them one thing. His hope. He would stop himself, even at the price of oblivion.